Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to another lecture on public speaking given by myself, uh, Eric Brownstein. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, slides and other visual aids and how to properly use them when giving a speech. Uh, it's a very popular topic um, among people who have questions about public speaking. Um, people tend to worry a lot uh, about their visual aids. The main point that I want to get across today is that visual aids and other slides, PowerPoints, whatever, are secondary. They are there to really support your speech, not to be your speech. Um, so, let's get started. <clears throat> First, let's go over a little bit about what we talked about last week. So, <clears throat> when you begin your speech, okay, you're going to start right off the bat. Uh, starting with a provocative question, an amazing or a shocking fact, a joke, evoking an image. You want to be at your best right out of the gate. <clears throat> Remember, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Uh, we want to avoid starting a speech with things like, thank you, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, I was only asked to do this yesterday, or something corny, cheesy that, that everybody's already heard before. Uh, we talk about uh, we talked about primacy versus recency. So primacy, what people primarily hear, the first thing people hear, aka your introduction. People also tend to remember recency, so what they hear last, uh, so your conclusion. Uh, so we really want to, when we give our presentations, to really focus on building a very strong uh, introduction and a very strong conclusion because that is what people will tend to remember more than anything else. <clears throat> uh, next, your audience will make value judgments about you, your organization, and your message in the first 30 to 60 seconds. So again, start strong. Same for preparing your speech. Prepare your speech with all of these things in mind. Remembering who you're giving your speech to, um, how many people will be there, understanding the room, etc. <clears throat> so we talked about introductions. I love this photo. Um, we talked about introductions and how important they are. Why are they so important? Well, your introduction is going to overview many different things. Uh, but first, it's going to get your audience's attention. They're going to be settling in. They're still not probably going to be focused. But your introduction will ease them into listening to you. Also, it discloses the purpose of your speech, right? Why are you there? Why should they listen to you? Why are you an expert on the topic? Uh, you establish your own credibility, which is why you don't start off with, this will take very little time. I was only told about this a few minutes ago uh, or yesterday or whatever it was. <clears throat> You've been asked to give your presentation or your speech for a reason. I've had to give speeches on topics that I'm not a, a major expert in, um, <clears throat> that I haven't studied, that I haven't practiced or worked in. I've had to do that before. It's a, a nerve wracking experience because you don't feel overly confident when going into your speech. However, why tell other people about that? Um, <clears throat> deliver your speech. Keep your confidence, keep your credibility, um, and really work on, work from the, 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 the standpoint of, I'm the expert and I'm here for a reason. Uh, I've been asked to give this speech for a reason. And therefore, you should listen to me. And finally, we provide the speech's roadmap. So what's going to be 
outlined during the speech and what we're going to talk about. So, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about visual aids. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them into tremendous amounts of detail. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, but we're going to talk about different types of visual aids. When people say visual aids, they tend to think of PowerPoint or some kind of presentation um, software program uh, with what they use. However, visual aids are any number of different things. So the main visual aids that people use, the major ones, and there are more than just these types, but uh, charts, graphs, objects, could be something like a cup, um, models, drawings, photographs, PowerPoint, <laughs> multimedia like movies uh, or maps. There are lots and lots and lots of different types of visual aids. You can even use people as a visual aid. Uh, it's done all the time. Um, think of models. Think of actors. Uh, they're all visual representations of something. Um, a, a visualization to aid um, perhaps the sales process or any number of different things. So let's talk about some of the things that we want to keep in mind when talking about very specific visual aids. The first thing we want to talk about are charts and graphs. Okay, and these two are, are so often, the, the terms are so often interchanged. Charts and graphs, the big risk when dealing with them is that you're so eager to put in lots and lots and lots of information. And as we've talked about before, the job of a public speaker is not to provide information. The job of a public speaker is to evoke emotion. Okay. Again, that's not to say that you should not provide factual information. However, your primary focus is evoking the emotional response of the audience, regardless of what that emotion is. The last one you want to evoke is boredom. You do not want to evoke that emotion. You can evoke anger, you can evoke frustration, you can evoke happiness, joy, jealousy, hope, whatever. But you want to evoke emotion. So, when dealing with both charts and graphs, limit the information as much as you can to your charts and graphs. Don't overly complicate them. <clears throat> um, and always ask yourself when you're dealing with a chart and for a graph as well, is the information at that level necessary to support the point you're trying to make? This goes back to understanding your audience. Who are you speaking to? Are you speaking to a group of experts who will easily understand more complex information? Or are you speaking to a group of novices who won't? Uh, based on that, you're going to need to adjust your presentation materials. Um, if I'm giving a presentation on corruption to people who have never heard of uh, any of the intricacies of the topic, I'm going to make my any charts or data that I use simplistic. If I'm speaking to an organization or a room full of corruption experts, then I can talk in more detail and provide more detailed data analysis, visualization, and things like that. So you want to take the information, the various information, and choose only the essential categories. Um, many different charts or breakdowns will provide you with lots and lots and lots of different sectors. Um, you know, I mentioned corruption or freedoms, and they have freedoms coming in all types of different uh, breakdown categories. Choose the ones that are strictly most important for your presentation. There is no need to expose people to every piece of data, every piece of analysis that's available. If you really want them to go deeper into it, provide them the link, provide them with the materials after your presentation, not before, because people will end up just reading the presentation and not really listening to you. They'll just read through the, the materials that you've given them. 
Um, same with grants, uh, with graphs, excuse me. Um, don't try and fit many, many, many elements into a single graph. There is nothing wrong with using two, three, or four graphs. Breaking down very specific information. Make the graph, like the chart, as useful as possible. Focusing on one, maybe two points. And that's it. For example, focusing on um, potential voters and actual voters. And that's it. 100% of people are potential voters. 70%, that would be nice, are actual voters. And that's it. And then explain the chart after that. Then you can break it down in more detail. Break down the actual voters by, say, age group, uh, using four or five age brackets. But you don't need to put all of that in a single graph, a single pie chart, for example, breaking all of that down individually. It will confuse people, and they'll spend so much time trying to read your chart and organize the chart and break down all of the information that they'll lose track of the speech and kind of stop listening to you. Use consistent, meaningful scales or reference points when comparing values. Um, the data should be easy to understand, and you should be collecting data from similar sources. Um, obviously, you want the data that you collect to reflect different outlets, but you want the breakdown to cover the same point. Uh, if I'm presenting a graph on voters and I talk about potential voters versus actual voters, um, but then I start talking about, um, you know, who attended and who didn't, uh, expected versus unexpected, and the numbers don't quite add up. Or, for example, I reference something in my graph without breaking down exactly what the number was. Uh, it's very important to consistently present your information and present accurately. Uh, don't muddle through your graph or your chart. Uh, don't try and confuse your audience. Don't get confused yourself. Um, better to answer I don't know than to present false information uh, that destroys your credibility as a speaker. Next, objects. Um, this is an often overlooked visual aid. Presenting an object or a model is a type of object, but if it's a small object, be prepared to pass it around, especially if it's a small group. If you're talking about a very large audience, hundreds of people, you're not going to do that. You're going to want to take your object and blow it up so that everyone can see it. Uh, if you want a really good example of that, you can look at Apple's launch of their iPhone. Uh, they use their iPhone, an object, uh, to, and they blow it up on the big screen so that people can see the interaction of the iPhone. But they hold it up and look, it's my iPhone, right? It's a very specific size so that people put the size in their head, right? A visualization of what an iPhone is. Um, watching Steve Jobs initial launch of the iPhone is a masterpiece of public speaking. I highly recommend anybody who's interested in public speaking uh, to watch that presentation. It's incredibly good. Um, so one risk, you know, I talked about small objects and passing it around. Um, it's a major risk to pass it around. You need to be very careful when you do so because passing around an object promotes side conversation and distracts people. Oh, look at this really cool thing that I'm now looking at and playing with and whatever. So make sure that you're prepared to, okay, pass it on to the next person. Don't let them sit and study an object that you've passed around in detail. They're free to do so if you allow them after the speech, obviously, because it's your object. It is something that you can do is just something to be aware of don't be afraid i passed out objects before you just have to be aware of what you've passed around how you've passed it around and keeping track of who has it and how long they've had it <clears throat> models um 
you know, we saw this model right here. You don't typically want to pass models around. They're likely to be fragile. Um, is the model too large or too small, uh, depending on the size of the room? Uh, is it something that's viewed in its natural environment? Or is it inappropriate for the setting? You know, different models fit best in different locations. Uh, some full size scale models aren't necessarily movable because of the fragile state of the model. Um, it's important to factor all of that into account when using something like a model for, for visual aid purposes. Drawings. Um, if you use labels, you don't have to, but if you use labels on the on a drawing, they should be readable throughout the room, especially if you post them, like if you, one, if you have a drawing, like an actual, like a painting, for example, if you have on a PowerPoint presentation, having labels on what things are is very important. Same for charts and graphs. Clearly label them. Uh, it's very important or people won't know what's going on. Uh, photographs. You can use them to present samples of a larger collection. Um, many artists will do this with training. Uh, excuse me, many um, retail houses will do this with artists. They'll present a couple of pieces out of a much larger set that they hold of the artists. Um, perhaps uh, showing items that can't be brought into the setting. Um, perhaps you want to sell a, an important piece of art, but that art is locked away in a vault. Uh, this is uh, always a risk with, for example, jewelry shows, uh, bringing expensive jewelry into a very large open location. Um, when you're using photographs, make sure they're high quality, clear photographs. Don't just bring a tough to see photograph, a very grainy photograph and blow it up real big because it still won't be uh, visible, uh, visible or understood. Make sure you're using for a presentation high quality photographs. Slides. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk more about PowerPoint a little bit later, but use readable fonts and maintain a consistent style on all of your slides or transparencies. People don't really use transparencies anymore. Um, they did when I was young, but uh, they don't do it anymore. Um, as you can see, and then don't put too much information on an individual slide. And I'll show you an example of that later on. But I mean, if you look at this, there's a very stark contrast between the background and the drawing or and the, uh, the, the text. Um, it's not a light blue dark blue text versus background you want a sharp crisp con uh, contrast between the type or the picture and the background um, and then we don't overload every slide with information multimedia um, displaying computer generated graphics slides videos sound clips etc be very careful with these. Um, they tend to distract um, both yourself and the audience. Um, the big risk is that the video that you show will be so impressive and entertaining, potentially visually as well, that they can overpower your message and people remember the video more than they remember the message. Visual aids are supports. They're things that help you. Um, they're not the crux of the speech. It's important to remember that. Don't treat a visual aid as an end to itself. Treat it as something that is supporting your message. Finally, maps. There's an example right here. There should be readable and clearly identifiable reference points, right? If you look at the map, there's the two dots right? The beginning and the end. There's the very distinct line of how to get from one to the other. Everything should be crisp and clean and easily understood. So next we're going to talk about actually using them now that we've gone through actual visual aids. 
Um, but before we jump into that, does anybody have any questions? Um, I appear to be pretty far ahead of the webinar, but uh, I'm going to pause this for a couple of seconds and see if anybody has any questions. So I'm pretty sure that I've paused and everyone will have had the chance to ask a question if they had one. Um, so I guess not. Remember, if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them. I have the live chat up right here and I can answer your questions uh, as soon as you ask them. So let's talk about using your visual aids. Okay. Now, if you look at the screen, I've seen these so many times when I see rookie presenters or people who aren't familiar with public speaking, this is what a screen will look like. Um, just overly cluttered and utterly ununderstandable. There's, there's no way to understand as a member of the audience what is going on on this screen. I remember... I was studying, and part of where I got the idea to initially create this course was from studying in St. Petersburg. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the professors had, had significant trouble with um, some of the most basic aspects of public speaking. We had a professor, well, a very good professor. I liked her a lot. Um, and she would have a lot of slides, not quite like this with all of the pictures, but she would throw tons and tons and tons of information on all of the slides. She would actually provide more information on the slides than she would talk about. So most of us, this was only a couple of years ago, so most of us had computers in the classroom. And so we were sitting there and we were looking up at the screen, not listening to the professor, but just looking up at the screen and typing, 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 typing all of the notes, everything that was on the slide. If you put something on the slide, it's important. At least that's the mind of your audience. If something's posted on the screen, it's important. So we're sitting there typing, 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 typing. And she clicks to the next slide. And the entire class goes, no, stop. No, we haven't gotten everything off the slide yet. And she was like, the slide's not really important. You should be listening to me. And we're like, no, you put it on the slide. If you put it on the slide, it's important, and we have to write it down. We actually stopped her for about 10 minutes while we all typed all of the information from the slides into our computer before we would allow her to go on to the next slide. That was the last class she did that um, because we actually had to do that two or three times to actually stop her from speaking and go back from the previous slide in order so that we could write down all of the information. You can see from this, pictures aren't clear. There's no explanation for why the picture is there. There's a random apple in the top corner that doesn't actually reflect anything on the slide. Um, there's graphs, there's a chart, but there's, as you can see, there's no explanation for what the chart is. There's no, what's the green line? What's the blue line, the red line? Why does one look like a graph? The other look with dots. There's no explanation for what the numbers mean. It's just information on the screen, right? And the words, it's a little different because we're working over the internet. So I'm sure you can read it easily enough on your computer screen. But imagine standing up in front of a large group of people and you've got this teeny, teeny, tiny font size. Nobody's going to be able to read it. And if nobody can read it, then they just get frustrated because they assume anything on the slide is important. So he put it on the slide. It's important. <clears throat> and as we move through, you'll see that all of the information on this slide are contained over the next few slides of my presentation, but in a manner that allows you to grasp it, to understand it, 
and allows for me to talk about each point in detail. So, tips for using visual aids. Um, now, if you look at the photo, it's much larger. You can see it. It's the same as in this slide right here. Um, the font may be a little small, but uh, if anybody can't read it, it says, what's this Dawkins? Another of your visual metaphors. Um, this is a way that you can uh, get around small, um, small font uh, in some of your presentation materials uh, if you have a photo like this. Where, truth be told, the photo pretty much explains itself, but you want people to understand the small font that exists, you can either read it off or just duplicate it somewhere near the slide so that people can read, preferably where the writing actually is, so that people can read um, what the presentation material says. So, <clears throat> first, when using a visual aid, We'll talk more about this when we talk about movement, eye gestures, uh, eye contact, gestures, and body language. But never stand in front of a visual aid. <laughs> if you had a professor who put visual aids or PowerPoint slides up on the screen and then stood in front of the screen, you'd be like, get out of the way of my presentation. Um, don't obscure your, vis your visual aid. You have it up there for a reason. Don't block it unless you really want people to focus on you. They'll just get frustrated that you're blocking the visual aid. Why take the time to make it if you're going to block it? Maintain eye contact. The audience of your speech, if you're in a classroom, if you're giving a presentation to a group of 10 people, if you're giving a presentation to a group of 100 people, maintain eye contact. Look at the people. I had another professor, and this was so weird. But his teaching style, he would put his head down. He would read from his notes exactly what we talked about not doing last week uh, during uh, the notes section. He would sit, he would read a paragraph. He would stop. He would look up at the classroom, scan the classroom left and right like this looking for confused faces or questions. Then he would put his head back down and read the next paragraph and then look back up again. And he did this the entire semester. Never changed his tone of voice, never looked at the audience, never looked at us. So fortunately, wow, that was boring. Fortunately, there was Wi-Fi in the room. So most of us are sitting there on Facebook uh, going uh, da, 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 just chatting on Facebook, talking to friends, reading news feeds, whatever, not really listening to the professor. Um, if you don't keep an eye on your audience, you can't react to them. Public speaking is a reaction of your audience to you as the speaker, and then a reaction of you to your audience. Maintaining eye contact, the audience is always your primary uh, focus. Um, when you lose eye contact, you often end up turning your back on the audience. Don't ever turn your back on the audience. It's typically seen as a sign of disrespect. Don't turn your back on the audience. Don't do it. If you're teaching and you need to write something on the board, try and write sideways so that you're not fully not facing the audience. Um, that's something that's difficult to do, especially when writing. It is of the utmost importance that you avoid as much as humanly possible, unless it is 100% necessary. Don't turn your back on the audience. Period. Next, it's best to introduce the visual aid before talking about the information contained in it. Right? So I have a cup. This is my cup. I use it to drink water or coffee. Right? But first, I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to show you a little bit of um, something that I use every day that's very important to me my cup. Right? Introduce your presentation material. Whatever it is, uh, I'm now going to introduce you to Dave. Dave is our head of sales. 
right? Dave is this, Dave is that, right? Introduce uh, the people or the material that you'll be sharing with your audience. <clears throat> Next, practice. Practice makes perfect. We talked about that with practicing your volume, your pitch, and your tempo. Listening to yourself speak, your, yourself speak. Practice with all of the visual aids. Just because you've used one, it does not automatically make you a master of something else. Saying, I've used PowerPoint, therefore I can use a model, is like saying, and I'm going to quote John Oliver because I love when he said this. He said, saying something like that is like saying, I'm a vegetarian, therefore I'm a master of karate. <laughs> Just because you've used one does not mean you're an expert about using another, especially if that involves a significant amount of movement. Again, we talked about understanding the size of your stage. Are you on a big stage? Are you on a small stage? Are there wires around you? I've seen many a speaker trip over a wire. I've done it before. It happens. It's embarrassing. But that was my fault for not fully knowing my, my environment. It is important. You must practice with each type of visual aid. I had to practice before I started giving uh, YouTube webinars, distance courses, because I hadn't given them before. Um, I react best in front of a group of people because I can look at people. I can make jokes. I can hear if people are laughing or not laughing. So I can know what jokes work and what jokes don't work. I know I like to get up and move. I'm, I'm an active public speaker. I get a huge rush of adrenaline from it. Now I'm sitting in a chair. I hate sitting for really long periods of time. I get fidgety and I move around a lot. Um, but that's something that I really had to practice and get used to. Um, it's the same thing for, for example, like I have here. Using a PowerPoint presentation does not teach you how to tie a shoe, right? Or to demonstrate tying a shoe to somebody. Um, you don't want to do something for the first time, if you can avoid it, in front of a large group of people. You want to have, as a public speaker, your, your effort to a T. Right? I know exactly how I'm going to do this. I know exactly how to present with this piece of material and exactly how to present with this piece of material. I know my PowerPoint slides. I know everything that I need to use. I know how to use my iPad and I know how to use uh, this painting. Right? Practicing using your aids. Let's say you want to use a video. Did you... Pause your speech and jump back and forth um, to give that presentation. So you have internet access. Now, I've had that where we've connected to the internet, but a video hasn't worked. Uh, it looks like our presentation has frozen a little bit. Hopefully that's just my computer. Um, but I've had that situation where I've queued up a video and been connected to the internet. And then I push play and nothing happens because the internet's not working. Um, prepping those kinds of things beforehand. Practice jumping screen to screen. Um, make sure that if there's a technical issue that somebody is available who, if you're not capable of solving it yourself, will be able to solve that problem for you. Um, for example, the other day I was giving a presentation and um, our IT expert, Artyom, uh, said, well, I'm not going to be in the office. So he set up a link to the computer so that he could access my computer here from a different office. And it looks like we're frozen on the uh, presentation again, but hopefully it turns back on and you can still use it. So. Um, yeah, talking about technical difficulties while having technical difficulties. Always fun. So, make sure your visual aid supports the message that you are giving. Um, talking about baseball and holding up a football doesn't make a lot of sense. 
Your visual aids should support the message that you are trying to give. What are you trying to say to your audience? And then what you are going to use will then reflect that in your visual aid. Um, it really does look like it's frozen, but hopefully everybody's still hearing me. Um, so next, supplement. Do not supplant the speech with the visual aid. Your visual aid should not have your entire presentation on it. It should not be everything that your speech is. The visual aid is there to support you. You are the primary focus of your presentation, right? You are presenting to the group, not the visual aid. If the visual aid was able to do it itself, no one would have to worry about public speaking ever again because we just throw the visual aids up there and people would use them. Visual aids they usually don't evoke emotion. They can, especially videos, but that's your role as the public speaker. Do not rely entirely on your visual aid. Okay, I could have given this presentation without the PowerPoint slides just giving a presentation. But I use the slides to reinforce the things that I am trying to say. Always keep that in mind. Visual aids are not crutches to lean on, but rather light lamp posts to illuminate. Visual aids are there to show in functional reality what you are trying to describe with words. Visual aids are important, they're useful, but they're not necessary. I've given plenty of classes without any visual aids whatsoever. It is quite possible to do just using the natural ability of a public speaker. Always remember that when dealing with visual aids. Okay, they are not the speech entirely. They are less, they are guideposts, they are tools to be used to make your speech better. So, ensure the logistics of the setting are conducive to the visual aid. Make sure everyone can see it, right? We talked about large print versus small print. All of the slides that you saw today all have reasonably easy to read print, except for the one slide that I was showing you that was a mistake. Your print should be large enough that everyone can easily, clearly read it. There should be distinct contrast between your slide and the visual aid. Don't get overly fancy with your PowerPoint scripts. It may look cool, but it's better to keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Kiss mentality. Keep that in mind. Don't make visual aids that are more difficult than they have to be. Okay, throwing in color, color is great. I love color. But don't overdo it by making the slides with tons and tons of really fun animations that pop in from all over and spin and twirl and it's overkill. Next, make sure your electronics are working. We've had some streaming issues today. And unfortunately, that's just the internet as it, as it exists in our office. Sometimes it's better than others, but make sure the electronics work. Um, I asked our IT guy five or six times today. Everything's working, right? Because we've had some issues from time to time with making sure that all of the equipment, that everything is properly working. Fortunately for me, he was available to correct those issues when they did pop up. So if any electronics aren't working, make sure that you have somebody there who can help you get those electronics working. And then set up before the speech begins. Why try and set something up during the speech? Uh, for example, if you have a YouTube video to watch, Alt-Tab flips, flips between screens on your keyboard, uh, on your computer. Already have the YouTube video logged in and set up so that you can go, okay, flip the screen and press play. Not minimize my presentation, open the internet. God forbid you have an embarrassing page that's already up there. 
you don't really want the audience to see that. So now I'm going to go and post, ding, 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 ding. I've got all of the presentation materials that I want to give. They're easily accessible. It's not me logging on, going onto YouTube, searching for a video, waiting for the video to fully load. I mean, if you've got your internet connectivity, start loading the video when you first arrive. Next, point out key elements in the visual aid, especially if one is complicated. I spent a lot of time on the, the bad visual aid, if you remember, right? This one. We spent a lot of time here with me pointing out. Oop, tables going crazy. We spent a lot of time pointing things out on this slide because it's a big, confusing slide that's meant to be confusing, but I'm using that for my advantage. I'm using that to convey information, but I spent my time taking you through the, the slide and what the problems were. Um, try, try and avoid distributing materials before the speech. It'll lead to people flipping through pages and reading materials or looking at stuff, rustling papers, and, and just distracting the audience in general. You can give them materials beforehand. Uh, just be careful with what you're giving them. Um, something in people's hands, we're much more likely to engage the thing that's in our hand, just human nature, than to stop and look at the thing on the screen and listen to the public speaker. First, I want to know what I have in my hands. Uh, it's also something that will help when people get distracted or bored. Um, you know, if, if I get bored, then maybe if I don't have something in my hands, I jump back and I'm ready to go. But now I've got this thing in my hand so I can stay distracted for longer. So be careful. Distribute. Typically try to distribute things after uh, the speech is over. Next, you control the presentation. It doesn't control you. Um, PowerPoint is a visual aid. PowerPoint is not the entire show. Um, it is critical to remember that. Don't get caught up by your presentation. Loading a presentation with lots of materials, like the story I told you, will leave people entirely focused on the presentation and not at all focused on you. I got to get all the information off the screen. Once I get all the information off the screen, then I'll listen to the professor. Then I'll listen to the speaker. The PowerPoint, especially a PowerPoint presentation, don't let it be your entire presentation. PowerPoints are there to support your actual presentation. Okay, next, use bullet points instead of full sentences. They're easier for people to read and you don't have to be perfect grammatically with PowerPoints. Like we talked about before, don't let the text or the graphics fly around too much, right? There are no need to be swooping, swirling, jumping, bumping things happening all over the screen. It's, uh, it might be cute, but it's not necessary. In fact, if you make it overly cute, it takes away from your slide. It takes away from your information. Um, next, don't keep jumping back and forth through your slides. I just did. I went back to an earlier slide, but I knew where it was in my presentation so that I didn't really go too far and it was very easy to flip back and through. You can, if you're not comfortable with that, it's actually recommended to duplicate the slide in the second place, right? Yes, it would have been better for me to have duplicated the bad slide back to where I was. Either make sure that your speech is organized enough that you can flip through. I didn't go all the way back to the slide in the very, very beginning. I went to a slide very close to where I was. Don't go back and forth, oh, this piece of information is there, but then I need to go back to the information on the previous slide and then to the next slide and then back again. It's confusing for the audience, especially if you have any of those animations in place. Then you've got to get through all the animations as well. Always a good idea to be properly organized so that you know where your speech, where you are in your speech and the information that you're giving. Don't jump back and forth. 
Also, don't change a slide and then stop halfway. Either change it and move on to the next topic, move on to what the slide contains, or leave it where it was. If you want to be on the last slide, be on the last slide. If you want to be on the next slide, be on the next slide. Again, these are sometimes you need to go back. It happens. It's fine. Try to avoid it. So um, that's 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 pretty much all I have uh, for today. Um, I see from the video that uh, we're a little bit delayed in terms of the lag time between the speech that I've given and the YouTube stream. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is pause, take a sip of water, and see if anybody has any questions. We're way behind. Well, it appears that we finally <laughs> caught up. Um, I apologize for what turned out to be the very long silence uh, that existed there. Um, the lag was um, pretty decent between where I was and where uh, the YouTube stream was. So um, I don't see any questions. Um, I hope that Everyone enjoyed the lecture. Everyone enjoyed the presentation. Uh, and hopefully I will see you all on Thursday. Have a great day.